Okay, there we are. Good afternoon to all. Welcome to seminar number 18. We are still with the uh, fellow Kalia. Uh, looking at the commentary on the Lord's Prayer, a short interpretation addressed to a devout Christian. David. Well, this text is uh, different from the kind of aphoristic ones we've been dealing with or engaging or having deal with us. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the best way to approach it is. I have, I have some sort of sketchy notes regarding uh, the various things that he is speaking about. So maybe it would be good if, if I was just to say, a, walk into those a little bit, mm -hmm. but it might be, well, it's up to the two of you. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to ponder here. Um, so maybe if you wish to stop and discuss some of it as we move along, that, that, that's certainly fine with me. Um, <clears throat> as usual, Maximus is, is dense. And there's a lot that is going on here. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak about a few pages and then we can, we can um, if you want to ponder some of the things in those pages, that'd be great. So Maximus's Lord's Prayer, this is addressed to a devout Christian. Um, that of course gives me pause right off the bat since not even sure I should read it as a result. But it is always so um, provocative to, to engage him. So, this is a, a close reading of the prayer of our Lord. It's a kind of personal response to it. And that response mirrors so much of what Maximus has said before and what the spiritual tradition is preoccupied with. So we see here a uh, I would say a kind of the golden strands in it strike me as being presence and absence, fear and affection. And what he calls the law of tenderness, which I must say I was quite moved by. The law of tenderness. That is such a shift from the way in which we so often think of law. And it, it, it reminds me of, of Jews that I've known and talked with and asked them about the law. And I was always so struck when they spoke about the law as such a gift to them, that the law was a joy to them. Often they speak about it as a joy. And uh, my sense is that it, for devout Jews, it gives them a kind of clarity. So they don't hesitate. They don't, they don't question certain things. They just run with it. So <clears throat> page 86, the purpose of God's counsel So the purpose of God's counsel is always and only 
the deification of the human nature. And the aim of this prayer is that it, it holds together all that we have been taught by the revelation, by Jesus Christ and his teaching and his action and his being. 287, he speaks about there being seven teachings that have surfaced for him. Theology. We'll think about each one of these. Adoption as persons by grace. Equality to angels. That's something that's somewhat foreign to me. Um, my angelology is, is, uh, is rather thin. Uh, unlike, say, Shia Muslims, who have a very highly developed angelology. My eldest sister, Muriel, had a kind of pious painting as a child of the guardian angel with two children rushing through the woods to the precipice and the guardian angel swooping down and uh, that's sort of my image of the angels from my, my childhood. So it's interesting that this is so significant for him and why and what he says about it. Then participation in eternal life. That's not waiting for it, not, but it is attending to it now. and then restoration of human nature. So on the one hand, there's this adoption as persons by grace, and then there's restoration of human nature when reconciled dispassionately with itself, when reconciled through when the passions no longer are providing the frame for how we understand ourselves. And then the abolition of the law of sin. And that sits to my mind sort of in tension with this, this sense of, of uh, the law of tenderness. And then finally, the destruction of tyranny, the tyranny of deceit. And we spoke about that before, Andrew, you have uh, rung the changes on that several times. The destruction of the tyranny of deceit of the evil one. So the Logos bestows adoption on us, that birth, and deification, which transcending nature comes by grace through the spirit. Transcending grace, transcending nature not overcoming it, not doing away with it, but standing above it, standing above what we see as natural, what we take so for granted, which comes by grace through the spirit. I had a thought when I read that and pondered a little bit, and it's personal and I won't dwell on it, but My mother lost her mother uh, when she was extremely young. She thought that my grandmother had died giving birth to her. And then uh, she was taken in by the neighboring family, adopted her. 
So she had no real memory of her birth home, although it was in the neighborhood and her natural father would visit all the time. Although she found this hard too, because it singled her out from the other children. So my mother thought that she had, she had killed her mother in the process of being born. And I didn't know about this until late, very late after my father died. And when I was talking with my mother that summer and um, she, we arranged for her, uh, we contacted her natural father who's still living. She hadn't corresponded with him for years since the war and he was alive and about to have his hundredth birthday. So we managed to send my mother to Norway. It's the first time she was back in Norway after coming in 1923. And um, she found out that of course her mother didn't die when she was given birth, but rather she died when my mother was about a year old of tuberculosis, very common. So that shadow uh, was with my mother until you know, she was, she was about 55 then until she had her relationship restored to her father and heard the story. And I thought about how, how we think of so many things as natural. And it's only when we're given the gift of bumping above that only then do we really see what nature is, but that gift of bumping above it comes by grace, the grace of her father speaking those words to her after all of those years and saying, solve, solve, no, 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 no. Adelina, she loved you when she gave birth to you. She held you tenderly for almost a year. That that is such a transformative thing to have what we think is nature transcended through, gave, through grace and it gives us a new spirit in our life. So from that day on, my mother always walked more upright and uh, had joy in her life which was uh, untainted. So page 288. And this is important in light of the transcending nature element, in light of the adoption element, in light of the restoration element. He restores human nature to itself. So in some sense, adoption we use that image for a variety of reasons, as you well know, the, you know, drawn largely from St. Paul and the notion that, that Gentiles are, dra are grafted onto the Jewish tree. But it seems to me that adoption is, has that theological and historical echo, but the point is the restoration, the restoration of the human nature. So the Logos purifies the human nature. That is it. If I go back to the illustration from my mother, no longer does that shadow, no longer does that smoke remain there. It disappears. There is a clarity that comes, a clarity about one's own self-understanding. And then there is also this discussion of the virginity of the Theotokos and the kingdom beyond division. That, of course, rings the changes a little bit on a, an old saw of mine that one of the deep spiritual meanings of virginity is not about hymen and tacta. It's about It's about being undivided. It's a, it's a symbol of integrity. 
it is a symbol of the kingdom of that way of being in the world which is not seen through the prism of divisions is there any any of that that you want to pick up on and or should i go a little further <clears throat> Why don't you continue your thought? Okay. We're making notes. We're, we can come back okay. to any of it. Yeah. Okay. So 289. The Logos destroys the tyranny of the evil one. This raises these issues that we've talked about quite a, quite a bit and where I am inclined to think of, of flesh and body. Uh, of the the body being real and the flesh being our presumptions about it. Also of, of mortality and immortality of morte, of the, the tragedy of being bound by fear of mortality and when one is free of that, one is free actually to be finite. So in some sense, it seems to me that the breaking of the prism of death is also the restoration of our freedom to be finite. And in a sense, our freedom to be mortal. He talks about, this is again 289, about petition one, the father, his name, his kingdom. Petition two, the person who, the person whose prayer is born of the father, our father. There's a really provocative book. I may have mentioned it to you, Andrew, uh, done fairly recently, a couple of years ago, by a Catholic priest who was visiting prisons. And he met the Pope in prison because the Pope tends to sneak out at night and go to prisons, wash, wash people's feet. And it's, the book is a sort of a set of, it's kind of meditation on the Our Father. But one of the things that, the priest who's the prison chaplain said, and that I have witnessed in my own teaching in prison, is that uh, men in prison have a strong sense that they have lost their father because of their action. And many of them have, I suppose, they become estranged. And they also have a sense that they've lost their children because of their action. So the praying of this prayer in prison, our father, is a singular reorientation of their life to discover that, yes, indeed, they alienated their father. Yes, indeed, they alienated their children. There is a transcendent place. We all have God as our father. And there is at least potentially a kind of liberation in that. Petition three, asking for daily bread, that it be daily. We'll come back to that. And then a kind of declaration, which is reconciliation. Forgive and forgiven. The divisions which need healing and the healing of will and of purpose. And then a fifth matter, which is against entering into temptation. Since this is the law of sin, as opposed to the law of tenderness. 
and then an exhortation, deliver us from the evil one. And the prayer, of course, is really, all of it together is, is a kind of thanksgiving. It's not all shaped that way, but it is all a kind of thanksgiving for the gifts of God given by grace that we experience in the world. So 290, this matter of vow and prayer. So vow is a reorientation of the will. And prayer, a virtue arising by grace. So vow, a reorientation. I vow to be oriented in a particular way. And that itself leads to a new stance of regard arising in us by grace. So number one, this matter of theology, um, our father as the name of the kingdom. It moves on to page 280, 291. And then there's this consideration of sanctification and mortification, destroying death by death. You know, it's the, it's the regular refrain at the Paschal liturgy destroying death by death and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life, bestowing it, restoring to all of our eyes and our memories that the person who has died can live in the light with us speaks about anger as the protagonist of desire and desire as the appetite which is put to death. So the intimate relationship between anger and desire. So 291, no 292. Thy kingdom come, may the Holy Spirit come. I mean, there is a sense in which, and he makes a, a note, I believe, that in one of the ancient texts we have of the church, this part of the prayer was not thy kingdom come, but may the Holy Spirit come. And the Holy Spirit rests alights, illumines, takes root in the person who is gentle and humble. The gentle inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth is the way that I learned that. And I've always wondered about the word a bit, but I think gentle is such an interesting way of, of phrasing it. So the gentle inherit the earth. And he speaks about how the earth is by nature a kind of middle place in the universe. <clears throat> um, or that it's, it's, it's a kingdom uh, from the foundations of creation. Uh, but it is that middle kingdom. And, you know, given your reading of Tolkien, Andrew, and all those other uh, epic narratives, uh, I was wanting you to reflect on the nature of the middle kingdom. 
maybe that'll come. But it's interesting, he then immediately talks about the images we have of, of that middle kingdom, uh, that reference to Paul about how in the kingdom there is no divisions, no Jew or Greek, no married or monk, no slave nor free. So no marriage, no tribal divisions in that kingdom. So the earth, as he uses it here, in some sense signifies the resolution and strength of, of inner stability, the immovably, uh, a kind of immovability rooted in goodness, possessed by those who are gentle of heart. He speaks about this middle kingdom as a place between honor and oblagi. That is between honor and strong public criticism and abuse. It's holding gentle any of those sorts of things that might be addressed to us. Honor which can so easily capture our sense of ourselves. And we think we are something or criticism and abuse, which can do that as well. So 293. He speaks about the inex indestructible power of the kingdom which is given to those that are humble and gentle yeah i love the way in which he sees power in humility and gentleness i mean it's such a different understanding of power reminded me of nietzsche michael i mean you can you can clean this up but i I remember when I was in love with Nietzsche and read him and the will to power and what have you, and we had some discussions in our philosophy classes that I thought one of the things Nietzsche was getting at was the difference between power and force. And um, that the Ubermensch at its best was the person of power, but not of force that we can, you can pick up on that, whether that's the case with Nietzsche or not. The point is one that interests me, that humility and gentleness uh, have, a, have a weight that, um, that is not given to the usual abuses of our world. So this characterizes the kingdom in which there are not these normal divisions, male, female, anger, desire the sense that one is attending to the world in a different way from the way we so often attend to it he then talks a little bit about intelligence or the noose how it stands alone, stripped through the virtues. So the virtues are not doing something. The virtues are helping us let go of things. Stripped through virtues of the affections for the body. I don't know that I'm right about this, but I would want to say for the affections for the flesh. I would want to say, we, you know, I've, I've so often found this monastic language confusing because uh, sometimes they speak so well of the body and of course, so negatively of the flesh. That is 
the body when it is reoriented around, around appetite. So I'll be interested in how you see that. So body and flesh, spirit and integrity, integration. So 294. This discussion of Elijah on the imbalance of dispositions and on what he's really speaking about in terms of integrity. And then he, he talks about how Christ is born. There's more than one nativity. Christ is born mystically. Christ becomes incarnate in those who are healed, in those who come to the place of dispassion. And the soul And this, this really means that the, the making of their soul is such that it gives birth to him. So in every, in every way, every human being that is given the gift of holiness, is given the gift of presence, is a kind of type of the Virgin Mother. The one that because of that gives birth to divine love in the world. And then in 295, this interesting reflection on generation, the generative versus begotten. And I must admit, I've, I've often wondered about it, you know, when we say the only begotten son and it's very easy to understand why Muslims and Jews take exception to Christianity on this ground. But I've never heard anyone say, but we're not talking about generation here. But we are talking about begotten. There's something else going on here we're trying to express that the revelation is trying to point to. And he's suggesting that in us as well, when we are begotten, that the Christ-like way is free of generation, free of its participation in corruption, freed to integrity, becomes integrated. Thus, no male or female, only personhood. No Jew nor Greek. That is, no contrary views of God. The Greeks affirmed, he says, a host of ruling principalities, of divisions into opposing operations and powers. It's the way polytheism works, or another way to put it, competing sacralities. The Jews affirm a fundamental principle, which is narrow. He says imperfect and almost non-existent, at least as we can apprehend it. And he says the Jewish understanding is devoid of imminent consciousness of life. The person without logos and spirit merely possessing logos and spirit as qualities, as accidents by participation. So all of that, of course, is his way in building on much of the discussion of the church fathers that came before him, of wrestling with the meaning of the incarnation. On the one hand, that this is God. This is not separate from the Father, from the creator and sustainer of all that is. And at the same time, this is a person. 
This is deeply, deeply particular and personal. Two ninety six. Building on this, he talks about how divinity is not one thing, nor does God have qualities. The unity does not differ from the Trinity by distinction of nature. The nature is simple. The nature is singular. The whole is the single unity. And again, bringing the changes on these natural divisions. The natural divisions of Jew and Greek, male and female, bond and free, circumcised and uncircumcised. All of these are subdivisions and symbols of law, symbols of living under the law or under the natural order as it has been reconceived through our social generations. Two ninety seven. But Christ, all is all in all, in spirit fashioning the unoriginate kingdom by means of that which lies beyond nature and law. Beyond nature, at least as we normally see her, the kingdom is characterized by humility and gentleness of heart. These two constituents are the perfection of the person made perfect in Christ. Humility and gentleness of heart. Then 298 moves to the phrase, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Do you want to take anything on or shall I just proceed? Please proceed. So thy will be done is a way of speaking about how one, one is praying to be freed from desire or from appetite, freed from anger. And all is offered. Only the intelligence naturally leading naturally leads intelligent beings towards the source of intelligence or the source of logos. So the logismoi in each of us leads to the logos. In creation, incarnation, and the Holy Spirit, our logos, our logismoi, offers solely offers the world solely to the Logos, to Christ, the likeness of God. So it's this <clears throat> play that he is so interested in and spend so much time on of The, the gift of our Logos when it comes into a stance of offering 
to the Logos of all that is. And when we live so, we receive as daily a, the life-giving bread that nourishes us and blesses our life together. We receive it, but he makes so much of this. We receive it solely on a daily basis. That is, it's, it's that which, which greets us when we are attentive and present to that which is immediately unfolding. I am the bread of life. So daily bread, he talks about the daily bread as this present age. And I would even go so far as to say the daily bread is this present moment, what is unfolding. Since we are, this is 299, since we are in this present mortal life, this finitude, give us this day our daily bread which thou hast originally pre prepared for human nature so that it might become immortal. Going back to Genesis 2. And I would say again there, so that it might become so that we will no longer be seeing the world. Our stance won't be one of fear in the face of mortality, in the face of death. So he who prays such receives the daily bread in accordance with his or her receptive capacity. So in some sense, he's saying that we all receive this all the time. This is kind of the grace of life. But for some, the capacity when your capacity has become, when you have become less, as Paul would say, so Christ becomes more, when your passions are less, when your appetites are less, you receive more of the daily bread. Christ teaches us to pray for what he commands us not to seek. That's curious, huh? Teaches us to pray what he commands us not to seek. So the stance of prayer and the stance of seeking are in some sense opposed to each other. So if we think of prayer as attentiveness and seeking as appetite, maybe that sheds light on that curious formulation of his. We are to seek only the kingdom of God and righteousness. Or we are to pray only for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Something we do not know. So it again speaks to this attentiveness and lack of presumption, lack of desire. And he reminds us to be careful not to overstep the bounds of prayer, not to fall into presumption or to assume
So page 300. Speaking about cutting off the soul's anxiety about bodily things, things which pass and how one comes is called to come firmly, to be firmly inclined towards the divine blessing that is greeting us through the presence of the incarnation in everyday life. So to live for God is to live daily. It is not to live for the future. And it seems to me it's not to live for some imagined paradise. To live for God is to live present to the kingdom that is now. He says that for we make the body rendered intelligent by the virtues a messenger of the soul and the soul once established in the good, a herald of God. And on the natural plane, we restrict our prayers for this bread to one day only. Only then can we proceed in purity to the next petition saying, and forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our transgressions. We began to talk about this at the baptism of John Isaac. As we forgive our debtors, God who by nature bestows these blessings but it is the recipient's free will that safeguards them. Three Oh one. Such a person knows only one pain. That is the failure to attain these blessings. The pain is to be is to step away from these given blessings into the land of presumption, to want to make something out of things. So the devil prompts this failure, but it is the person's weakness of will with regard to the divine and not holding fast to the gifts of blessing for which one has prayed. So a dispassionate concern or a dispassionate holding in the visible world opens a person to forgive those who sin against one. So I suppose it's, it's a form of that old psychological insight or not so old modern psychological insight that the things that we take exception to in others, the things that we feel hurt by when others do them or articulate them we feel hurt by them because they are our passion. We're reacting to something that exists within us. So this dispassionate concern uh, is when the person himself becomes a pattern of virtue for God Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God is beyond imitation. We pray and ask God to come so that we may imitate God. 
as God dispassionately forgives, so we may dispassionately forgive. When our will is in union with the principle of nature in this way, God and nature are reconciled. But failing such, we remain self-divided in our will and cannot receive what God offers. Since the principle of nature is a law both natural and divine, and there is nothing in it contrary to the Logos, when our will functions accordingly with this principle, it accords with God in all things. Such a condition of will is an inner state of grace of what is good by nature and productive of virtue. So 302. <clears throat> to make peace with all is to be free. from the disparities of this present age. A pure disposition towards those who offend us opens and leads us not into temptation, but delivers us from what is evil. A pure disposition towards those who offend us opens and leads us not into temptation, but deliver us, delivers us from what is evil. A heart brought to God that is not free of grievance <laughs> and illumined with reconciliation with its neighbor will be handed over to temptation and to evil, so that having retracted his judgment of other people, he may learn to purify himself of his own sins. I mean, it seems to me that this is so I suppose in monasteries, they could see this vividly because they're living in that kind of hothouse where you see enmity developed or where you see anger easily ignited or jealousy or what have you. So the recognition, and Maximus is so good at this, that when things are ignited like that, you really have to wonder what is it within the heart and the mind, within the past of the person who becomes angry or however they respond, what is it that has led them to that? So there is an unhealed passion that bubbles up and is called forth. Or one is handed over to the temptation, to the evil. So temptation is the law of sin. What is evil, the devil, who has mixed this law of sin with human nature, transferring the soul's desire for what is good to what is forbidden.
What is forbidden? I mean, that's a, I'd never thought about the word before. So for and bidden, we'll come back to that. The grace given, the integrity given that is there in nature is corrupted. So when we choose the passions of the flesh, our nature is defiled by the law of sin. God, honoring our will, steps aside. And the sower does his work. The evil one nurtures the seeds. 303. This brings us to an end here of my walking through this a little bit. Value in the insubstantial passions. I think of the insubstantial passions as the passions associated with nostalgia and the passions associated with idealization. Honoring, valuing the insubstantial passions more highly than nature. We become ignorant of nature. We step outside of nature. And when we do that, we step outside of ourselves. We are beside ourselves. We're fragmented, fractured. And tyranny, not nature, takes over. Its power is directly related to its illusory character. Yeah, it's always striking to me that the less real something is, the greater its hold it so often has on us. The person who obeyed nature with his intelligence or another way of thinking about this, the person who was in, uh, had a disposition of the oblate, oblation towards nature through the noose. Nature pure and undefiled, faultless, free from hatred and from all alienation for what by nature is akin to the person. This person receives from God a double grace. Forgiveness for offenses already committed and protection and deliverance from those that may come to greet us in the future. For those powers of evil will not prevail for the simple reason, the person's readiness to forgive his neighbor and their debts. That's my little walk. Um, The emphasis on forgiveness throughout um, seems to, I'm not sure exactly why, but it, in your explanation also seem, seem to um, bring in what I take to be the 
central and almost impossible moral challenge of of our of Christianity or the Sermon on the Mount in particular and the injunction to love um, not just your neighbor, which is referred to yeah. at the end, but your enemy, which and so that would that would ins I, I think we're probably invited to probably have to extend the the um, injunction to forgiveness in just that way. And of course, these, these are blurred distinctions. Um, your neighbor can become um, your enemy rather um, fluently mm. in, in, in circumstances, you know, um, yeah. beset us. And, Well, I don't know that you can do it morally. I mean, I don't think this is, you know, so many of those kind of injunctions on the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> are either a Jewish joke or they're trying to point to something, a hope that one can come to a very different place. I mean, it's what, I guess what, what we refer to by deification, by the notions of theosis, by the notions of of um, no longer having our appetites in control. So about a kind of transfiguration, seeing the world in, in different terms. So I think the reason Jesus Christ says, love your enemy is because his teaching is about how, how not to have any enemies. And that nobody is your enemy. What you're faced with is suffering people who think they're your enemy. And you may think they're the enemy too, but it's because we are seeing things through the prism of division. And that if we could but glimpse the fragile humanity of others, then we would, as Maximus is talking about, the, the law or the, um, uh, the rule of law would give way to the law of tenderness. I mean, that, that's a, an important emphasis because the actual um, justification and, and we should, you know, handle that in a kind of gingerly way um, up for loving one's enemy is declared to be, to be like um, God, which of course is, um, always a, it's um, a kind of transformative act so far as it's possible, but that the application is always in some measure um, beyond this if we're finite and we're trying to approximate the infinite. So there is a, there is a kind of um, sobering joke, but there, there's also something, um, a challenge because a joke doesn't have to obliterate um, a mm -hmm. sincere, um, openness to transform because that that um, simultaneously presupposes of course a recognition that of our deficiencies and, and which is wrapped up with the the petition to um, not 
fall into temptation because that's yeah. a kind of you know grounding in our deficiencies in the, the wrong sense in which we contribute to the implacable war of nature against its yeah. itself and which is probably something we can we can do that um, creatures um, that haven't been created in the image in quite the same way um, can't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it means that we can probably be a lot crueler. Yeah. Than other animals. That's, but it also means we can be saints. Yeah. Probably more often we, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just feeling in a demoralized mood these days, but probably more often the former. In, in small, subtle ways, in my yeah, yeah. walking around as brutes. Oh, yeah. What what a uh, what a nice gloss on the what you were drawing our attention to with great emphasis earlier, the, um, gentleness, which I I think uh, I don't know. It's as a translation, I settles well with the I more than the meekness with which I was familiar when I was growing yeah. That seems more one-dimensional in a sense. But I, I don't even know the, um, the what the Greek word being translated is. Me neither. Part of, part of gentleness is not presuming, huh? I mean, when you think of, or at least when I think of people being gentle, in certain circumstances, for example, where there's been injury. You know, they're gentle because they don't know what all's unfolded here or what's happening. So they're gentle because they know that to presume might mean you would take the life. You know, I mean, even if you think of, you know, EMTs or something, you know, you've got to be gentle in part because you don't know, you don't presume. So, I mean, humbleness and gentleness dance together. We don't know the spiritual condition of other people and why they respond or behave the way they do. So we can judge them by some code or we can react to them so often our reactions are born out of our own unhealed passions. But gentleness is I mean, at least for me, when I was reading it, I thought, yeah, wouldn't it be lovely to be gentle and humble? <laughs> I wish that I was that sort of had that disposition some of the time. Well, some of the time I have a little bit of it, but boy, oh boy, it just makes such a difference in how one's likely to respond. But again, I think that uh, this becomes a, a gift and an orientation, a stance for us, a disposition for us to the degree that we're no longer ruled by a neurosis. You know, we're no longer, we no longer got all that stuff that we have, got, that remains unconfessed and unhealed and um, ignites us. Like um, just to comment and uh, walk back over a few things. Initially, a couple of things, and then, and then I have a deep, another deeper question. I think for you, David. I like I like how you you two have been distinguishing between gentle and meek. Michael, you said meek was it a little bit one dimensional? I think, or, or one 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 kind of one way. I th I thought you said something like that. Gentle, and if we think of meek as just being receptive. 
or, or, or a response. Gentleness is, is active. And then David, just following up, even without a scene with an EMT, to be gentle is to be present and attentive and loving because ge gentleness is part particular, right? You, you yeah. can't, you can't, there's no, no, no app general application of an idea of gentleness. It's always particular to the moment. I really like that. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, it, it th this this might relate to what David was saying earlier about the uh, uh, the Jewish um, approach to um, the law when he was referring to the law of tenderness. And tenderness. It, too, yeah. There is. Um, I mean, the, the notion of being a gentleman now is probably probably sounds um, almost yeah. um, I don't know archaic and something that ought to be um, cancelled insofar as it's asserted, but then it would be kind of ironic because it's not the kind of thing that one asserts. But there is, um, there is a kind of um, historical gentleness that is part of um, a kind of person that is reared in Christendom in the Anglosphere, and it's an English word we're using in translation. It's there's a notion of being um, a gentleman, and there's a long tradition, you know, rooted in um, the Christian infusion of this uh, ancient culture, um, reflected in the word gentleman, and it it can be the kind of thing that goes through the in which one is being socialized in a certain way, and one goes through the motions, but there's always a, a catch. And there's always a sense that while you might, by default, be falling into the law of um, a kind of law of um, tenderness, hypocrisy is, of course, always surrounding those who presume to be um, gentlemen by right of birth or something like that. And I think that it really is a more, um, if, it, if it finds its, um, proper religious orientation really is a, a different kind of concept, not associated with status. And you know, so there's a kind of a sort of floating paradoxical sensibility around, uh, around gentleness that, that um, is important because we don't come out of nowhere. We, we, um, some of our sensibilities yeah. and attitudes have been conventionalized, but yeah. we, we have to make them authentic for us, <clears throat> not, a, not create of them a kind of source of social division. And so gentleness could degenerate into a kind of form of snobbery, which would be sure. deeply ironic. I have another homely example from my I was out at the monastery this last week and there's been this difficulty that has existed with some of the people involved. And one of them uh, said to me um, how he was really straightforward, you know, I'm just a straightforward person. And I thought, isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's saying this in connection with his responses to to another person that I know he loves and has an enormous amount of regard for. I didn't query it or do anything about it, but but it occurs to me in light of this The difference between being straightforward and being gentle is that gentle has something to do with the other person. Gentle has something to do with what is in front of you. It's not just, it's not about you. Being straightforward is about you. But gentle is a regard for what's in front of you and is a is a, a stance, a way of responding that takes into account not your own preoccupations, but takes into account that which has been laid before you.
I, I really understand what you were saying earlier when you say suggest that it reinforces or is um, uh, you know, kind of at one with a disposition of presence. Yeah. What you just said. So Andrew, you were going to take us somewhere. Oh yeah. Well, <clears throat> I I want to take us just through a series of notes I made when you were speaking on what you were talking about, and then ask a couple of questions uh, just to, to to probe you a little bit further, because I think you're really onto something with how you're. Uh, I mean the, the the whole the whole the whole the whole the whole thing was was remarkable, but how you're considering um, freedom. <clears throat> and so that that's where we're going to land finally. But in the in your in your latest remarks, when you're talking, I like how you how you characterize the insubstantial passions as those distractions of mind, distractions from presence of mind, right? And then we read in Maximus that it overturns nature, and deceive. Our eyes are deceived because we have imagined, right? And it strikes me that so much of of freedom. And, and how you've been using it, I think, um, this time has to do with not being free from something, like not freeing from the body, but to free, to be free to be a body, not to be flesh. You know, mm -hmm. you, 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 you flagged the body, flesh, spirit, integrity, integration earlier for us to come back to. And integrity has something to do with it too, I think. And then you also distinguished you know through maximus begottenness and generation and you, you use a very interesting phrase you, you said be, to be begotten is to be freed to in integrity be freed unto integrity right the these are all freedoms to be finite that's a phrase you used this time and last time right? free to be finite so when we think of freedom, often it's it's to exceed, <clears throat> it's to exceed or to um, uh, over or 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 be uh, be unimpeded, un unconfined. But that's not what what you're talking about here. You're talking about a freedom to be finite and 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 a fine integral finite being, which is who we are, freedom to be, you use the phrase restoration, you know, uh, of our nature. Right? Now, I imagine that this kind of freedom ends before God. The telos of this freedom is not the telos of the divine. So then if freedom completes itself, let's say, before God, that would be over against ideas like Bardeyev's that freedom is basically divine or divine is basically freedom or a number of other existential, you can see the ramifications going down. If freedom ends before God, is this what St. Gregory means when he says God is play? Is this what you're putting? Because it, it's a I, I, I hope I'm being coherent. It seems to me that you are through Ma with with Maximus, um, suggesting a freedom that has quite uh, profound philosophical depths. But perhaps I'm unaware of precedents or or associated ideas that you have in mind, or perhaps I've I've, mis I've misheard you. I hope not. But what, does that does any of that? What do you think? <clears throat> so what what comes to mind when you mention this notion of of uh, Gregory that? Um, Freedom is play. The opposite of the opposite of play is war. I mean, that's the extreme opposite. It is 
It is to draw the lines. It is to be opposed to. It is the desire to have one's way. Play play tenderness the law of tenderness the um, just looking for something. Um, I mean, one of the remarkable things about play or that I think play illuminates is um, the attentiveness to the other. There is in play a, a recognition that you both are in the field together. And even, you know, I, I played a little hockey and I remember my most thrilling experiences in hockey had nothing to do with winning. It had much more to do with the kind of dance. And so even when you're, you're dipsy doodling and coming down the rink and stick handling through people, the, the mutuality of it, the mutual movement, turning something into a dance is really where the joy is, where the delight is. So I've always found it odd, even in games of competitive sport, when there is a loss of regard for the others. Because you can't have a game without the others. You can't play without the others. So they've given you this, this supreme gift. The other is a supreme gift. And play requires skill. The discipline, skill is given by discipline. But in the end, it's, it's, it's telos, it's purpose. is the excellence of the play. The excellence of the play itself. So beautiful. this, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just casting about here a little bit. Um, So it, it highlights for me that the notion that, that, that freedom in this sense doesn't exist in here. It really, in one sense, it is the, it is the freedom to bondage, to use one of the stronger <laughs> phrases from, from Paul. It's the freedom to be, to be, deeply, deeply present 
to the reality of others. So freedom from sin, you know, that nice little phrase is to be free from your passions, which make it impossible for you to play, which ensure that you only have war or you only have your own will. That is your unhealed will. Your will, which is now in service to your appetites. So to not have that, I mean, to be free of those appetites means to have the play and delight of the world restored to you. Even your being restored to you. You're free to be. And that that is always becoming, you know, that's always a kind of unfolding, which you don't control. The temptation is to revert to something because you're afraid. But say more about it. I like what you were saying. That's really um, play as dance. That's perfect. That's perfect. That, and that's our highest spiritual image too, right? I really like what you just said about play. I think that's a, that's um, that's profound. A freedom to be deeply present to the reality of others. It is, as you say, a bondage in the sense that it is all of you, all way, always, all the time. Play is something different. And that's why I, I think you've nicely, you've nicely distinguished how that is freedom, but play is something uh, that tr transcends even that, to, to use your word for, for, from earlier, transcends even that. And then, of course, the opposite of play is war. If play is mastery, as you've, you've also said, war is competition. It's being unmastered. It's being turbulent. And the master is, <clears throat> is not one that rules over something. I mean, I learned this. Yeah, no force, from, no force. Yeah, yeah, I know you know this. I learned this really from my father watching him with tools. You know, the master carpenter actually understands the tool, understands the wood and plays with both to bring about that which has integrity, that which is beautiful, that which works, that which makes new. Can I can I shift tack slightly to ask another another in another direction? Is that? <clears throat> I don't know that you can ask, but you could think about it with us. <laughs> I want to. I, oh, no, I want to. I, I want to. Uh, I want to renew your thinking to 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 have you elaborate a little bit more about some earlier uh, some of the earliest comments you made uh, on adoption. Adoption. Not, not, not in the context of your, of your, of your family tale, because that has a particular historical set of details, but, but in the general sense. And I was wondering, I was, I was, 
Okay, so my note is adoption as restoration. I think you said that adoption yeah. as restoration, right? Yeah. And then I thought that's from life, like lowercase l to capital L, you know, from temporal, let's say chronological life to, to, to um, divine life. I wondered if, if that what was kind of meant that, that you are given a new font, a new, a new, a new uh, kind of um, uh, exemplar in, 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 the, in the kind of deepest spiritual sense. And then I wondered to, I, I want to ask you about that, but it's related also to, um, to what you were speaking about um, with, uh, with, the virgin, uh, with the Virgin and how our Lord was born outside of the, the pattern of generation, right? Which you equated with, um, mm -hmm. with, with death, right? Outside the pattern of generation. And so his life being free to be finite is without illusion. Yeah. So is it that life to which we are adopted? That's. I'm sorry if it's a little bit tangled. Yeah. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. Those two strains. So your notion of adoption, or I mean, I mean, pardon me. Your uh, just to deepen that thought. Well, I, I mean, I just query it because I don't, uh, I don't, I, I don't have a satisfactory understanding of this. Um, the way Paul uses it, I mean, I understand it, understand what he's saying about the Jewish revelation is particular. That's one of its, that's its great gift. The covenant is with the Jewish people. A way of viewing that is the covenant is with Israel, but what does Israel mean? Uh, most often in the Hebrew Bible, when Israel is used, it is used for faithfulness. Those that are faithful to be nearby God faithful to live in that relationship. In the context of Christianity, this theology of adoption developed as a way of, as Paul put it, to graft Gentiles into the tree of Jesse, to graft them into the, the revelatory tradition of, of the Jewish people. And it's, um, I mean, maybe it, maybe it shows as much as it hides. Um, or maybe it's a, maybe it's a way of speaking about a much more common condition and is not simply to be read in terms of the, the Jewish Gentile question. Obviously, the covenantal tradition stands within the Hebrew Bible. And so obviously those for whom that was not, not their, their inheritance, they come to it in some fashion. And in that sense, they're adopted into it. I, I, I understand that. I also wonder if those for whom it is a natural inheritance that does not mean that that natural inheritance is taken. It does not mean that that's it. They also have alienation and struggles and misunderstandings. So maybe, maybe that spiritual meaning of adoption is something that's just much more common I mean, it's a reflection on, on the spiritual journey and that, that we have periods of time in which we are not present. We have periods of time in which we are even alienated. We have periods of time in which we think we are part of 
the covenant, but in fact, we have not adopted it. We haven't taken it in. I mean, adoption's a curious image, isn't it? Because it has something to do with people caring for someone that they did not give birth to. But we know that it, there's also a huge struggle for the person that is being cared for to actually adopt the family that loves them. It's a two-way street. But I don't have, I don't have, I, I don't know. I was just querying it, that's all. What do you think? That's beautiful. I like turning it, turning it not just into, uh, from a fact into an action too. It's not just adoption, this happened, but yeah. to adopt, to be, to constantly, you know, <clears throat> adopt the, 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 the correct, not correct, but the, 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 the you know, oneself to the presence of the moment. Yeah. To adopt yourself is something. That's also particular. Yeah. What do you think of Maximus's comment that, at least that's how I read it, back on 288, that the virginity of the Theotokos, in a sense, is, is, is the kingdom. That is, it's the place where there's no division, and the kingdom is where there's no division. So, in a sense, we, the spiritual condition of virginity that is to live in the presence of no division. It's another way of speaking about presence. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? That virginity is speaking about presence. It's not speaking about the lack of something. It's speaking about the fullness of something. That's exactly that's exactly my next note from your talk that I was going to ask you. Let, let me let me let me draw you up on that and also point you one more place and have you reflect, please. Yeah, virginity, undivided, integral, the image of the kingdom. Yeah, that's what you yeah. said. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And turn turn to two ninety for a minute. You 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 read part of this passage, but if you would just read out. Um, uh the, the last full paragraph that, that begins our father heart in the heavens it is appropriate that just um just until, until he starts talking about the trinity as a uh, as a uh, mm -hmm. well just, just just before he says what matthew calls kingdom and he goes on to explicate the text just, just would you would you uh, would you mind reading it aloud and then reflecting on it because here he has <clears throat> um <clears throat> He has the 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 um, the um, the kingdom figured as the Holy Spirit too, right? Yeah. And so there's a theme here. There's that, and then there's also his idea of theology, which he immediately equates with mode of existence. But but pl please just walk us through this text, David, because and, and tie it into what you were just saying about virginity, because I think I think there's really something there. Our Father, who art in the heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. It is appropriate that at the outset, the Lord should teach those who pray to start with theology and should imitate them into the mode of existence of him who is by essence the creative cause of all things. Hmm. For these opening words of the prayer contain a revelation of the Father, of the name of the Father, and of the kingdom of the Father. So that from this beginning, we may be taught to revere, invoke, and worship the Trinity in unity. 
for the name of God the Father exists in substantial form as the only begotten Son. Again, the kingdom of God the Father exists in substantial form as the Holy Spirit, what Matthew calls kingdom. In this context, one of the other evangelists has elsewhere called Holy Spirit, saying, may thy Holy Spirit come and purify us. May thy Holy Spirit come and make us whole. For the Father's name is not something which he has acquired, nor is the kingdom a dignity ascribed to him. He does not have a beginning, so that at a certain moment he begins to be father or king, but he is eternal. And so is eternally father and king. In no sense at all, therefore, has he either begun to exist or begun to exist as father or king. And if he exists eternally, not only is he eternally father and king, but also the son and the Holy Spirit coexist with him eternally in substantial form, having their being from him and by nature in hearing in him beyond any cause or principle. They are not sequent to him, nor have they come into existence after him in a contingent way. The relationship of co-inherence between the persons embraces all three of them simultaneously, not permitting any of the three to be regarded as prior or sequence to the other. Hmm. How do you hear this, Michael? Um, l let me defer to. <laughs> I don't want to, this. Is, this was a really, you know, re really interesting uh, discussion shaping up, and I want to just say something for the sake of saying something. I remember when I first heard somebody say, maybe it was myself, I can't remember who it was, <laughs> one of those moments, that the Trinity is a metaphor. I mean, it's an amazing way of trying to speak about something that is singular but which we apprehend in a variety of ways something that greets us in a variety of ways So part of what this does, I think, and I, and we have to remember that Maximus was living in the midst of these debates, which were always trying to, well, many of them were debates which were trying to be reasonable, 
in particular kinds of ways. And so the debates, I mean, virtually, virtually all of the debates at the seven ecumenical councils are debates about the nature of the incarnation, God, the Holy Spirit, the Theotokos, the nature and wills of Jesus Christ. They're all about <coughs> trying to divide it up in different sorts of ways. And I think that Maximus in this passage is saying, no, 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 no. Don't do that. If you do that, you don't realize what you're doing. You're gonna lose the point of it all. There is nothing contingent here. There is nothing prior here. There is only something singular and whole here. Virginity. Hmm? Virginity. Singular yeah. and whole. Yeah. The image of the kingdom. Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is rather harrowing to, to think about the um, ways um, in which um, the, um, this debate shaped up and, um, and, and Maximus's um, ultimate fate, yeah. he, uh, you know, stepped uh, outside of um, the the interpretation that was going at the time, which is ironically replaced by Maximus's interpretation. It's, it, it's such a grotesque irony when you think, I, I, I assume that all of us probably say the Lord's Prayer at least once a day and, and think about it and just the hallowed be thy name, I, I can't help but, you know, whenever I say that, to think of the, the logos as in multitudinous ways, and it's, um, but always is something, you know, integrated into, to start, you know, annihilating um, people, or, you know, treating the way Maximus was eventually treated, um, isn't exactly um, <laughs> it isn't exactly um, hallowing the, the the name, the logos, and everything that is enjoined. I mean, this this of course is relating to what we were saying about you know the disposition of of um, gentleness, and it's uh, mm. the opposite of that. And and yet you know it, it's important to um, you know to affirm. Um, some configuration of the um, of the creed, um, but not to. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'll stumble here, so I'm just going to shut up. But you know, the creed comes up. Different creeds come out of this um, tortuous history. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's mean that we have to. Applaud the, uh, the the means by which uh, you know we evolved, of course. And I'd never thought of it before, but Michael, as you were speaking, it it came to me. They cut out his tongue and cut off his hand for a reason. The tongue's the Holy Spirit. The hands, the incarnation. You know, this was, I mean, maybe I'm pushing it here, but there's a deliberate act here. I mean, in what they chose, how they chose to 
bring his life to an end. And that must not have been lost on him. It, it goes to show just how implacable the, uh, the war of nature against itself is. I mean, the, the transition um, into, you know, the kind of sea change from the, um, the kind of what Aristotle called the crowning achievement of uh, the virtues and morality, the, the megalopsychos, the, you know, the, the man who is um, fully possessed of himself, but, you know, has understands that and I, you know I, I think Aristotle is trying to um, moderate and change the notion of what kind of figure this represents and arguably he doesn't go far far enough and then for Christianity to in a sense invert this image and to elevate mm -hmm. um, the figure of, the figure of humility, or, or the um, the disposition of humility, I should say, is um, extraordinary. But it is so. I mean, and this is one of the things that many of my non-Christian, um, some of my non-Christian friends will um, bring up that um, you know the history of Christianity doesn't history of societies you know these aristocratic societies not you know post the roman empire in different parts of the world that tried to tribal societies that tried to incorporate christianity and, and were and transfigured by um, the christian faith didn't just magically become something else this has been a, an historical work and it is um, something that personally is something that we don't just you know, achieve. It's, it's a continuous work, both historically and personally. So, so there is that, there, there is um, grace, of course, but as uh, that passage, which um, we, we quoted, which I, I can't remember the page number now affirms that the, uh, I'll get this wrong, but the but free, free will, um, can continue is, is never um, we're we're never never let off the hook. Our agency is um, important, and it's a you know it's a always you know a semi corrupt um, agency that it always is also required, and it's um, yeah that's freedom. That's a, yes. that's a beautiful way of, of, of saying what, 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 what we were trying to get at earlier. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a, um, it's as much a burden um, yeah. without, you know, trying to create a slogan as a, as a, um, a blessing, obviously. Yeah. Remind me of where that passage is in Aristotle. Um, so, sorry, let, let me refresh my memory. The, um, what, Oh, 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 right. Yeah, no, the, um, in, in the, in the, in the Comachean ethics in um, chapter four, he gives a, um, he talks at length about, you know, the, um, the Megalopsuchia, the great yeah. man, which sometimes is translated yeah. as pride. I don't, it's kind of strange because greatness of soul is a more obvious um, direct mimics the Greek word. Um, in, interestingly enough, I mean, Aristotle is doing a bit of a revision here. Um, he, he's creating of this, he, he, he suggests at one point that, okay, the great soul man is he who deserves um, much and, or, or claims much, but correspondingly deserves much. So he's someone who's outstanding in his um, attributes and who, who he is. But Aristotle, the revision comes in when he specifies that, that the great souled man is the person who, who um, is outstandingly virtuous. And so yeah. he's, and he only mentions this in one other passage. It's in the, um, when he's talking in the, um, in, in the, in the logic about, um, he's just giving an example, so it's just in passing. 
and he talks about the people that he counts as um, great soul and he, and he notices something strange. And I think this is the motivation for his revision, giving him a kind of more of an ethical dimension, not just someone who's some uh, brutally magnificent you know, mm-hmm. person like um, IS or a- Ajax. And so he, he, he divides up the territory a little of the examples a little bit and mentions in um, Achilles and IS or Ajax and um, who else does he mention? Uh, I, I think, okay, I can't remember, Fa- famous um, Greek um, general who figures in one of um, Plato's poems, the symposium, um, who, whose name is escaping me. And, and then he, um, he mentions on the other side of the ledger, um, st- strangely, Lou Sander, the Spartan um, general, who you know, was kind of a, like the Odysseus kind of figure, got by more of using his wits than his brawn. Socrates, and I'm thinking who else he mentions. And he says, okay, either, either there's a single, um, either Megropsukia is a single um, term, or it's, it's ambiguous, and we're actually referring to two terms. And he sort of hints at the latter. And I think when he's talking about in, in the ethics, he seems to have Socrates in mind. Mm-hmm. Someone who um, can, and this goes back to our discussion of gentleness, someone who can, uh, has that resilience, which the person in the middle kingdom has. Yeah, yeah. That kind of um, can take insults and isn't going to you know, fly yeah. off the handle uh, like Heracles and dash someone's brains mm-hmm. out. And, and also uh, so, someone who, um, who, who um, has, um, has a sense of the resilience. What are, I'm trying to remember what else he, he says. But anyway, and also someone who um, isn't so full of himself. And, um, and oddly enough, I'll, I'll just throw this out in passing. There's actually a kind of um, precedent for this. And oddly enough, it's a, it's a figure who comes down with the tradition that we sort of wonder about and later Greek dramatists would sort of disparage. It's Odysseus, but Homer's Odysseus, I don't, I think does already present a contrary view of greatness of soul, which is embedded not with um, pride, but with a deep abiding humility. You know, this, um, this comes out in the banquet speech in chapter, um, yeah. I mean, I live with the Odyssey, but, you know, chap- chapter um, 10, when he's giving some words of advice to one of the less um, horrific um, um, hum- 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 sin- sinful of the suitors. Um, and he, he gives this wonderful speech, um, which essentially says that man is the frailest of all creatures. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of meditation on just the terrors and horrors, yeah. the you know, potential evil of existence, and the attitude that one might adopt not to complain and not to you know wage war against people, but to live according to the law of the gods and to um, have a kind of regard for um, people. But it, but in, interesting enough, it also mentions in passing. Uh, um, the, sorry, I'm going on a little bit. I'll stop right, oh, right now. Good. But 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 he, he also mentions, and this this is such a striking image, and it's and it's why the it's, it's it almost anticipates Aristotle and even provides a corrective of his revised view because it it says our, our, um, Odysseus says something like this that our our news, our intelligence, and I think in in the Greek at that time. Um, meant something, you know, even more substantial is something that can just be um, whisked away by the god, by by Zeus at any time. Yeah. Even that which it makes us most that the Stoics would later think would make yeah makes us secure is not insecure, and so it's a, it's a, it's a startlingly. Tragic view of things, but also 
uh, uh, view and joining us to a kind of deep humility that seems to go against many of the strains of this whole tradition leading up to Christianity. Yeah. Hmm. That's beautiful. <clears throat> so relate that michael to mm. how david has been talking about the the kingdom the kingdom relate that that image of the of the of the you know of the of the person well well D david actually related it in a way that just sort of forgot me as he was speaking thinking about odysseus you know just as the someone who has a kind of um um someone who has a kind of um resilience that is well i'm, I'm putting i'm maybe at, adding a bit i i don't know um but because my notes are kind of fragmented but what i what i wrote that i heard you saying is resilience some rooted in in goodness and gentleness i think that's what you said mm -hmm. that's yeah andrew's in well, you you can confirm, obviously. Yeah, no, that's right. Go on, go on. It, no, no, and 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 that's. Um, I think the um, you know Odysseus is someone that strikes a lot of people the wrong way. He he is um, he is um, full of himself, but he actually does, of course, spend twenty years trying to get home. He's on a journey. He's trying to find himself. There there there, there is something. <laughs> he does transform himself and trying to get home. <laughs> And he, um, he, at the end, he, um, when, when his um, nursemaid, um, Uraclea, um, tries to celebrate, and after he's obliterated all of the suitors and performed, you know, acts of justice and what have you, and she tries to celebrate the victory, he, he immediately um, censures her and says, look, this isn't about um, what we have achieved. This is... Uh, and immediately he's reaching towards something higher, you know, yeah. Athena, Zeus, and and, it's, um, and, and he, he Homer Homer does this also in the Iliad. I mean, Achilles is a transformed person, even though we only see a glimpse of it in the tent when Priam comes as a supplicant and tries to, you know, mm. um, meets this lion who is implacably um, vengeful and won't release Hector's body that he's been desecrating, which is a huge thing for the Greeks. And he relents and it's just a, and we see a kind of transformative moment, only a glimpse, but in a, Odysseus, I think we, we see something more that he himself articulates in, hmm. in the speech that he gives to help this poor, suitor who unfortunately is held in place by um, athena so he can't escape and he will meet his doom the last but but that aside um, odysseus does seem i mean it's it's a very tricky interpretation because odysseus always presents himself deceptively and and that's why he um it's easy to um mm -hmm. have apprehension about him but i i do think he um the gods, after all, present themselves deceptively, and he's in a dangerous world. But I do think that he, he does um, become something of a contrast to those who are um, really caught up in a, in a world of um, brutality. He does um, suggest <laughs> another vision. You're probably familiar with those images from some of the early church fathers where they make use of Odysseus as uh, as a type of uh, even as a type of Christ oh. you know, bound to uh, when he binds himself to the mast in order to sail past the sirens. Um, and you see it on Greek pottery uh, images of this. And uh, Yaroslav Pelikan makes a lot out of this in his, in his little book on Jesus through the centuries where he talks about 
the light of the Gentiles and how the early church fathers were looking, you know, the early Gentiles were looking back at their own literature and they were seeking echoes of the revelation. There's a beautiful book I read here a couple years ago. I think I may have even sent you a copy, Andrew, of um, this American professor who, who teaches a seminar on, uh, on the Odyssey. It's done so for years with students and um, has written this book on teaching Odysseus and his father comes to the class. His father's old and retired. Do you know this book? Michael, do you know this book? So, sorry, I, I just moved because there was a phone in the background, but no, I, I, I haven't read it. I read a review. It sounds like a very engaging. He's been teaching this all of his life. It's a beautiful um, book. And, he, and his father came and took a, um, I have a student right now who, who has taken in the first, um, you know, kind of, um, discussion posts the, the view of this gentleman's father so it's a it's really really beautifully written too it's very very poignant yeah well that was uh, wonderful to hear about you're thinking about that michael thank you so much i i think the um the i i was unaware i probably used some of these images but um, I think the early early Christians who used Odysseus were more perceptive than Dante and his Inferno, who also uses Odysseus. I mean, he, he's sort of onto something, but he's um, I, I I think a, a tad unfair to Odysseus or Homer's Odysseus. No, yeah. Latins are like that with the Greeks. <laughs> yeah, and I was thinking too of the the, the different typologies that, that you get within Greek culture itself, in which you know great Greeks of the past are the reverence for them wavers between you know uh, well vague definitions of religious devotion. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Say la vie. Good. God, I wish I had another lifetime. You know, it's ridiculous. Isn't it? 